The news today has been overwhelmingly worser than what I thought. First of all, the war has resumed, just as Jerusalem has said that it's going to resume because of a breakdown of negotiation tactics. But what you're fixing to hear is going to, going to be absolutely mind-boggling to think that if if what they're saying is true, which I'm pretty sure there's there's no need not to think that it's not pertaining to the wall of Jericho uh, plot that the leader of Jerusalem, Israel, knew about prior to a year ago. Now, it's one thing to know, and it's another thing to actually know that something like this is occurring, because we've known now for quite some time, since 1993, that certain terrorist groups over in the Middle East has already declared war on not only Jerusalem, but also America, that once they get through with Jerusalem, they're coming after America. We have known this now for quite some times, even though we was hit unexpectedly, blindly, being blindsided, pertaining to 9-11. The things that you're fixing to hear this morning on this particular broadcast, I want you to take with a grain of salt, number one. Number two, I want you to realize that just because somebody knows, you know, that's like me being a Christian, I know that I have enemies right here in my own neighborhood. I know that I have people that could care less about my life. I know that I have people that actually wants me to be dead. But just because I know that, looking at it from a biblical standpoint, does not mean that I'm still not going to intermingle with people either in the grocery store or Walmart or the gas station down the road or whatever. Because life has to go on even though you know these things and until you actually see a true movement of somebody that's trying to bring harm and hurt to your life, you really can't do nothing about it until after it occurs. I had no idea that I was going to come back to such ridicution and persecution to Northwest Tennessee whenever I first moved back here in 2014. Now, looking at hindsight, you know what? I was warned. I was warned like six months before I ever come back here that whatever you do, don't go back north. I misunderstood that. I assumed that going back north was back in the area where I was originally born at, which would have been north of Chicago in a little community called Antioch in Antioch County in St. Teresa's Hospital. But because I know that there are certain people that wants to destroy me, I still have to go on with my life until they actually pursue that movement. Now, since my brother has died in 2017, I can now look at how the movement was implemented here in Northwest Tennessee and how that their endeavors that was supposed to have been directed towards me affected my brother to the extent that basically I no longer have a younger brother at the age of 51 because of his emotions getting the best of him and him not being able to handle what was happening here with his peers and his so-called friends. David didn't understand or realize my brother that he had enemies too as well. He had people out there that was abusing him and using him. And, and uh, because he was associated with me, 
automatically made him a target. Automatically. So whenever you look at when you look at this spiritual warfare from 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 that aspect, you have to recognize that whenever Jesus was attacked, it wasn't just Jesus. It was Mary, it was Joseph, it was all the other cousins, it was all the other relatives that was associated with that family, as well as the disciples. This spiritual warfare that we're involved in is real. A matter of fact, it's more realer than our lives because our lives eventually is going to end. Looking at it from a supernatural standpoint, with the angels and the demons, their lives will go on forever unless God intervenes, in which he promises that he will, towards bringing destruction to Lucifer, the Antichrist, the false prophet, and those that follow after him. But as of now, we still have to live in this world. I still have to live among this community. I know that not everybody in this community hates me or are against me to the degree that they want me dead. The leader in Israel has had problems all along with some political issues. And I don't know if they were just distracted I'm pretty sure eventually it will all come out in a wash one way or the other what has occurred. But the information that you're going to be given today on this particular broadcast, please, please examine it with gloves in analyzing the fact that if he did know, that was kind of like America knowing that we had already done been challenged by the Middle East, but we didn't know when it actually was going to occur. Now, granted, there may have been certain people that know that it was obviously upon us that was right at fixing to occur that didn't blow the trumpet right or didn't let the right people know to be able to bring a, a great enough warning to prevent it from happening that I still believe to this day should be held accountable for, especially those in higher positions. But it's basically the same thing that now a breach of communications has been brought forth pertaining to the people over in Israel. Now you keep in mind whenever I look at Israel or most of the Christian society over here in the Western world looks at Israel, they look at Israel in the sense of the Holy Land where Jesus Christ himself come from and preached his gospel and was rejected by his own people. We look at the Holy Land in a good sense rather than a bad sense. But you have to ask yourself a question, the $64,000 question, why would have God have issued out advisories in the first four chapters of Revelation, speaking to the seven churches, that he hated those that professed to be Jews and was not. And was not. Indicating, first of all, that there's people out there that are bogus. There's people out there that are imposters that belong to the Jewish sector or claim that they belong to the Jewish sector and are not. And are not. So there are fraudulent Jews probably all over the world. Not just over in the Middle East. Probably all over the world. And they think, they think, okay, or this has been the original concept, that if they profess to be a Jew, that they can now stand under the umbrella of protection that by and large, the people won't anti-Semitism them in attacking them. Up until just recently, we have seen just the opposite effect coming from the world towards if you profess to be a Jew or in the Jewish sector, 
odds are, instead of you not being persecuted, now you are going to be persecuted. My point, before we go any further with this, is that you do not have to be an original, authentic, genuine Jew to be persecuted by these evil demonic spirits. You can be a true born-again Christian, which is basically a Gentile. And it don't matter if you're an American Gentile, Russian Gentile, or, or you're a Middle East Gentile. Those who have accepted Jesus Christ into their lives authentically are substance of being persecuted that even Jesus told his people again and again and again, for if they've hated me, they'll also hate you. For if they hated me, they'll also hate you. People don't realize this spiritual warfare of just exactly how real that it really is. Even those that profess, that claim that they're spiritual people, really don't understand the significance of what's going to happen in the last days whenever it talks about it in the Bible that Satan will rise up or Satan will come down, either way you want to look at it, towards bringing great destruction to humanity because Satan knows its time is short. Please listen to this, but as you're listening to this, please be very, very cautious in how you judge what you hear today pertaining to the actual true Jew over in the Middle East. Because like I said, there had to be a reason why that God the Father repeated again in the seven churches that he not only hated the deeds of the Nicolaitans, but that he hated those that profess to be Jews and are not. Now, we've known all along that God the Father hates the Antichrist. We've known all along that God the Father hates those that are deliberately disobedient to him and those who basically are of the Antichrist um, spirit that God never would have kicked them out of heaven if God loved them. So we know that whenever Lucifer done what Lucifer done up in heaven was a reflection towards provoking God, and then God and the heavenly kingdom had to do what they'd done in getting them out of there. So there is hate against the Antichrist. There is hate against the devil himself, against Lucifer and, and the false prophets, and those that claim to be Jews and are not, just like God hates those of the deeds of the Nicolaitans. This thing is unfolding, and before it completely unfolds, it is my duty to warn people ahead of time to prepare, to prepare, to prepare. And I've been trying to, to blow the trumpet now for 30 some odd years, ever since nine tapes went to the White House in 1988 during Ronald Reagan's administration, and I was ignored. I was not only ignored, but I myself was provoked. And I knew because of the standards of the American laws that basically, regardless whether it was me or my brother David Jeffrey Jackson, if we would have retaliated the way that some people would have retaliated of some people that was provoking us the way that they was provoking us in our own area, our own neighborhood, the way the law is twisted here in America, we would have been basically shooting ourselves in the foot. So the only thing that we could do at that time was grin and bear it. That's the reason why I put on my truck digging in. But if you'll read the scriptures on the side of my truck of digging in, it also tells you that the very entrapments that my enemy intended to be for me will now be reversed and the entrapments will now be for them. So I had to set back. I had to be a punching bag or a whipping post or a floor mat for those that was doing what they was doing while the weekly county court system sat idly by and allowed it to happen at the expense of 
collateral damage, looking at it from a war perspective, of now taking out my only remaining last sibling, David Jeffrey Jackson. So please, as you listen to this program, I want you to be very, very sensitive in what you're looking at, what you're listening to, because this can be the very defining moment of whether or not we're going to go further to the right or further to the left. And we've already taken various politicians as well as preachers have already taken us down this road of going to the far left. And if we continue to go down this path to the far left, you can expect the consequences that goes along with it. Please listen. She was visiting family in a town near the Gaza border when the October 7th attack happened. Yarden was with her husband and their three-year-old daughter. All three were kidnapped in a stolen car. They then tried to flee, but the terrorists opened fire. That's when Yordan handed her daughter to her husband. The two of them escaped while Yordan was captured, recaptured. After 54 days in captivity, Yordan was reunited with her family yesterday. Wow. And joining us now from Israel is Yordan's brother, Gilly Rahman, who first joined us on the show last month when he had no idea about her whereabouts or how she was doing. Uh, things must look very different today. Thank you for coming back on the show. Uh, how, uh, good morning. How, Thank you for having me. How, how is the family doing? What was it like to, to reunite? Uh, I'm sure there are many different emotions. Yeah, um, <clears throat> obviously we are uh, relieved and extremely happy uh, and also worried about the general situation and also yeah, then sister-in-law Carmel uh, is, yet, is yet to be released. Oh. Uh, specifically about, um, about these moments, it's, um, it's almost uncomprehensible. Yeah. The level of joy uh, of hearing her voice again, seeing her picture, um, meeting her, seeing Geffen, my niece, reunite with her, it's... I just... Uh, it's truly, truly unbelievable, and I think that uh, every hostage family deserves these uh, moments of uh, of rejoice and of uh, and of peace and calm, knowing that their loved ones are back. And this is uh, beyond words. Yeah, I I get that completely. Uh, just looking at the pictures. Um, has she been able to share anything about her time in captivity, or is it too soon? Uh, she, she, she shared some. Uh, we are not allowed to uh, elaborate, but I, for example, I can give you, for an example, I can give you. We found out that uh, most of her time um, in captivity in Gaza, she didn't know if her husband and daughter are alive. Oh. She knew about it only by a brief radio broadcast that she uh, overheard. Uh, somebody dedicated a song for Kinneret, her mother-in-law that was murdered, uh, and mentioned that she and Carmel, her sister, are uh, uh, hostages. And by that, she concluded that because Alon and Geffen were not mentioned, that they are not uh, either killed or taken hostage. So only after most of her time, she knew what happened to to her daughter and to her husband, and that they were able to to be saved. Just imagine which kind of darkness she she yeah. uh, lived. Just a trauma for yeah. both sides of the family, for the people waiting and hoping for her to come home, but not knowing what her condition is, if she's okay. Right. And the same for her in captivity, not knowing if the daughter that she handed off to her husband, if they made it. Well, and, and, and that's what we, 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 keep, we keep hearing, uh, so many not uh, having any idea uh, what, what was going on beyond uh, beyond their own uh, terrible situation? Um, is is she re in relatively good health despite this horrific experience? Uh, 
Yeah, I would say relatively well will be a good description. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. And the family, uh, where where are they spending most of their time together, working with counselors? Is there a process to try and um, help them yeah, reassimilate? Well, um, as you probably know, uh, it took Hamas a long time to release them. It happened really close to the end of the mm -hmm. of the, of this day ceasefire uh, around midnight. So we saw her only at 4 a.m. Uh, mm -hmm. They were transferred to a hospital. So we've been there for a day. Uh, we spent the whole night there together and the whole day together in the same room uh, with a lot of counselors and uh, physicians. Uh, but uh, then we came back home. So we are now all of us at the same uh, apartment with my, at my father's place. <coughs> it's very fun. And we just came back from uh, the first time uh, taking my sister and her daughter to the beach. Uh, to be out in the sun, to feel the water, to feel the sand, uh, to to feel what freedom looks like. Mm. Gilly Roman, thank you very much. Uh, wishing you many more days like that with your family. Thank you for joining I, us I this morning. I want to remind us that it's how crucial is it to get back on, go into the process of uh, pauses and release of more hostages. Uh, it's crucial, and they have very limited time. Thank you for that. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much. It's and just about two minutes past the top of the hour. Yeah, and I wonder if the extraordinary news, the shattering news oh. that came out today, is actually going to push the Netanyahu government to try again, uh, to try to get more hostages out, because there's no doubt. Um, yeah. Ashley, uh, the uh, the news from the New York Times, just extraordinary that the Netanyahu government knew for a year the specifics, the specifics of this attack, down to using paragliders. Um, and, and, and then you add on top of that the fact that there were hostages, there were there were people being um, raped, shot, killed for seven hours, children hiding for seven hours before anybody came, they even tried to rescue him. Yeah, I mean, that, that story was, to read, was both devastating and gripping when you read those specific blueprints of what the Israeli government knew um, and what in particular uh, that one analyst or agent was saying um, that, that they plan to do this, not just they plan to do this, but now that they have done a, a mock run through of exactly what they plan to do. I mean, I couldn't help think of, you know, in our country, bin Laden determined to attack on 9-11. It sort of just had that parallel. And right. it will be interesting to see how the Israelis, um, who, who are already devastated by this, mm -hmm. respond to the fact that their government the, could The FBI agent, I think it was in Detroit, reported that there were uh, Muslim men using, uh, using simulators who said they wanted to learn how to fly a but plane, not but they wanted to not land take it. off uh, or land. Yeah. And somebody reported, hey, this, this doesn't sound yeah. right. And no. again, just ignored. Well, the New York Times report that you all are talking about it is reporting that Israel knew Hamas was planning a wide scale assault a year before the October 7th terrorist attack. And they knew details. According to the paper, Israeli officials obtained an approximately 40 page document, which they codenamed Jericho Wall. It outlined point by point exactly the kind of devastating invasion that led to the deaths of about 1,200 people. The Times writes Israeli mil military and intelligence officials dismissed the plan as aspirational, considering it too difficult for Hamas to carry out. Earlier this morning, Israeli Defense Forces re responded to the report, writing a statement. Quote, the IDF is currently focused on eliminating the threat from the terrorist organization Hamas. Questions of this kind will be looked into at a later stage. That will add to the list of questions that they are putting off to a later date. Yeah, the pre yeah. What was Benjamin Netanyahu doing? Was he distracted? Why the delay in the response? If something is happening 40 minutes away, women right. are getting raped, babies are getting shot, people are getting run out of their homes, why is it taking seven hours? I mean, this seems like, how do you not see this as a choice not 
well, to respond I've got, at this I, point. I, I've got to say that the, these statements, and we'll talk about it later, we'll talk about it later, that would work it just if they were the United it States and we're not depending on funding from another country. But I was a strong, I don't think it would be surprised, anybody that watches this show, I, I was a strong supporter of Israel in Congress as well. And I would be the first person in Congress to say, wait a second, wait a second, we're giving, we're giving more money to this government to execute a war? Like when we have a guy over there that has an approval rating maybe in the teens, is hated around the region, is not respected around the world? I mean, Eugene, this, some this does not make funding for Israel any easier that Netanyahu is doing everything he can to hold on when he knew this attack, his people knew this attack was coming for a year. It's not good enough for members of Congress on the Hill, is it? To just say, you know, we'll talk about this later. We're fighting a war right now. You guys just butt out. Yeah, you can't want funding and help from a, from a huge country like the United States and not expect some kind of questions, this question in particular, after this reporting. I mean, it's already been super complicated trying to figure out what um, funding could go to Israel, when it would go to Israel because of the splits, both within the parties themselves and um, the tension between the parties, Republicans and Democrats, and what they want to see. Um, and the if you think about before October 7th, where the United States was going and thinking about Israel, more important thing thinking about Netanyahu, President Biden and Vice President Kamala Harris were constantly talking about Israel as a, a democracy that was backsliding, that, mm -hmm. you know, kind of alluding to the idea that oh, there needed Clinton to be something past like Netanyahu. This. Yeah. And so that, now we're back Years to that, ago. right? Like more questions about what was Netanyahu doing. And he is facing a lot of pressure within his own country. You just heard from that brother uh, of the hostage. They are going to continue to ask the questions, get all the hostages out. And now right. with this, why didn't you, why weren't you helping these people before these things happened. The question uh, or, or the statement, um, we're going to wait till later for every question that we ask. The unfortunate problem here and why it falls flat rings untrue is that the answers to these questions would help everybody in Israel and the U.S. supporting us move forward. You, you can't leave these. And again, even strong supporters. There's of the, bad answers. Even strong supporters of Israel and the United States, and I put myself right up there. We're not blind. No. We can watch the television. We can see what's happening in the West Bank. <laughs> the situation doesn't get like the, the, the West Bank is becoming a, a, a more, more chaotic by the day. What does that mean? It means we get further away from a two-state solution, which Netanyahu has fought against for over a decade now. That means there's a possibility, if you're a supporter, strong supporter of Israel, that you're now looking at a two-front war, possibly a three-front war, when the IDF has their hands full with Gaza. And, and Frank, I've just got to say, you and I have talked through the years. You've yeah. talked you've talk, privately. We have yeah. spoken about your family. We've spoken about um, the Holocaust. Uh, how how it has impacted your family, how it has impacted so many families. I spoke with with a man, um, uh, I, I won't say his name here, but uh, that, that a lot of people know that was, was practically in tears talking about how his generation, yeah. you know, like his generation let down those past generations that survived the Holocaust, got to Israel, they would see the numbers burned in the arm, and then when they tried to get their grandfathers or grandmothers to, or fathers or, 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 or mothers to talk about it, they'd start to talk and they'd stop and go, that's all right, we're here now. We're safe now. And this guy said, I feel like our generation let all of those people who side the Holocaust down by allowing this to happen. And now we find out it's actually worse than we ever imagined. I want to ask you, yeah. as someone who this is extraordinarily personal to, yeah. just tell, tell me about this headline. Tell me about this story. How do you feel? How does your family feel about this? One of the essential promises of Zionism and of the state of Israel was that it would protect the Jewish people from a recurrence of the sorts of 
pogroms and the destruction of the Holocaust and the utter incompetence displayed in the face of this sort of threat and to know that it was coming for so long and to do so little to prepare. And in fact, we also know that battalions of troops were shifted to the West Bank where there were where settlers and were, were provoking tension with the Palestinians in the West Bank. And so in order to protect Bibi Netanyahu's coalition, Israel's security was sacrificed. And okay, I think so one of the if you can explain to our store viewers, because we brought this up earlier, yeah. Netanyahu didn't want to bother with Gaza because that didn't involve him politically. The West Bank, when when he gave license to extremists yeah. to set up illegal settlements, yeah. and let me just say, illegal settlements, he knew that he was going to cause unrest. And politically, him trying to provoke the West Bank and, and, and undermine the Palestinian Authority, what did that do? That helped him politically with the religious extremists. So he had a political reason, and Israelis yeah. know this, for ignoring Hamas, who said, we want to kill all Jews and we want to destroy Israel. The entire arc of Netanyahu's career is self-preservation at the expense of the national interest. That was true in the demonstrations and the controversy over the court that was leading up to the war. And it's actually true in the course of the prosecution of this war. Netanyahu, in the early days of this, gov of this war, had an opportunity to form a coalition, a genuine coalition government, where he ditched, we would ditch the religious zealots and the messianic uh, settler movements that are part of his government and form a government of the center that was much more competent. The foreign minister, the national security advisor, all these people who populate the uh, Netanyahu administration are incompetence. They don't have the capacity to pull off the sort of diplomatic end game, the sort of uh, project that's required in order to re rebuild Gaza in the wake of this. And the government has consistently sacrificed any sort of thinking about the end game in order to preserve this cockamamie, dangerous coalition. Extremist coalition. And yeah, yes, I mean, it's not like we weren't hearing from people inside of Israel that Netanyahu had pushed out secular Jews who were extraordinarily professional, who had built up the reputation of the IDF and Mossad in exchange for bringing in, well, I would just say, people that were called clowns by Israeli insiders. And, and we see the consequence of this. The consequence... See, this is all news to me. And I'm sure it will be startling to a great deal of Christians that does side with the true Jew that now they're realizing that they're running into the same problem as what the Americans did of basically having the wolf guard the hen house. And it's and it's extremely sad because if the if what they're telling is in fact true. They have been betrayed. They have been betrayed by their own people from within that has allowed for this to happen. And I personally feel the same way about 9-11. Is that we was betrayed by our own people of not protecting not just the Christians, but the non-Christians too as well over here in the Western world in the continental United States. The Bible is very clear that the enemy is out to kill, steal, and destroy. Jesus never, never, not one time, talked about the enemy in a lightful, delightful, casual way. Not one time. He was always very, very serious-minded in, in rebuking this evil because he knew what this evil was capable of. 
even until the very last day, whenever they captured him, and they was beating on him and persecuting him physically as well as mentally, um, the the abuse that was going on. And Jesus looked at him and said, for what good work dost thou persecute me for? Because they knew that because of the powers, the supernatural powers that followed Jesus' ministry, that the dead actually did get raised, that blinded eyes did actually get to see again, uh, that, that people was healed, that, that, that water was turned to wine, that big groups of people was fed by just a very, very small amount of uh, of fish and loaves that was basically impossible to feed that kind of a group of people. They knew, they knew that these miraculous miracles followed after him. That's when one of the centurion Roman soldiers said to Jesus while they were still beating on him about the time that they put the crown of thorns on top of his head mocking him said for what for a good work we persecute you not for, but because you claim to be something that you're not, towards you being the only begotten son, the son, the son of God, chosen by God for a savior for your people, we're persecuting you because we classify you as you being a blasphemer, a phony, a fake, an imposter, is why they was beaten on Jesus. And they admitted that because it was his own people after Jesus had went before the governor and after he went before another judge that his own people was saying, away with him, away with him, away with him. Because they was not willing to compromise at that time. And as far as I know, a great deal of them over there still are not in accepting who Jesus actually said that Jesus was. And that's when Pontius Pilate, the way I understand it, went to a bowl and dipped his hands into the water and spoke very elegantly about this matter and said that I wash my hands of this. But he gave the people an opportunity because the day of Passover, it was a tradition to release one prisoner that was actually already convicted of being executed and they chose the prisoner that they knowed Barabbas that was a scoundrel he was a ripoff he was dirty he was corrupt he was nothing but a thief they chose to release Barabbas rather than choosing to release Jesus so at that point in time dictates that it was Jesus' own Jewish sector at that time that was under the old Mosianic laws of Moses, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth, that decided that they wanted Jesus dead. Away with him, away with him, is what that they was hollering. Away with him. Everything that Jesus preached on has not only and is not only being fulfilled, but the very things that he said that he would raise his body up again on the third day turned out to be very factual. That to this day, the majority of the people in the Middle East are still in debate about. I have never been in debate about the two hands that miraculously come out of nowhere that saved my life in 1983. I have never been in debate about 
the angels of God that come down from heaven on my birthday in 1988 that placed a physical, non-seeable, spiritual crown of thorns up onto my head that I can feel even to this day pertaining to the anointing upon my life. I have never been in debate about not only hearing about this form or this type of antichrist that confessed before a great deal of missionaries during the time that he was bringing forth his demonstrations that he was not the actual antichrist but he was a he was a follower of the antichrist towards him being satan in the flesh i have never debated those things just like today i still do not debate that good is greater than bad that light is greater than darkness that the fulfillment of the scriptures pertaining to the meek inheriting the earth is and are going to take place regardless whether I get any support from the western continental United States or whether or not I don't get any support. God's will will be done regardless whether I like it or the whole community in northwest Tennessee don't like it. That's the part that they have yet to understand pertaining to somebody being chosen and being anointed of bringing forth a message in basically being a, a, uh, a contributor of fostering a ministry that nobody, even to this day, has stood up and said, you know what, Juby? We believe in your testimony. We're going to support the windmill ministries towards you being the founder of and God choosing you to help to orchestrate. To this day, December the 1st, year 2023, I still have yet to gain a true congregation, a Joe Osteen support team that truly supports the Windmill Ministries missions. And you wonder how come things has went flubbed up, not only here in America, but all over the world? Because people are not real. And I've heard this said even by some people out in Arizona that I used to work for. Bill Luke Chrysler Dodge off Camelback Road that your message is too extreme, Juby. Your message is too in-depth. It's too serious. And that's why the people has rejected your message. Well, first of all, it's not my message. It's not my message. It's the message that God has given to me to give to others. Now, if they don't like it, then they need to go back to the original core of origin to the source and take it up with God. Because you know what? I didn't write the Bible. I didn't write the book of Revelations. I didn't write the book of Daniel. I didn't write all those other prophecies that are to be fulfilled in the last days because it says in the Bible very clearly that all things that have been written must be fulfilled in the last and final days. I didn't write that. All I am is a carrier. All I am is is, is the messenger with God's divine message. It's not my message. Just like the Windmill Ministries missions, that's not my ministry. All these preachers that want to start a big ministry, regardless whether it's Oral Roberts, Jimmy Swagger, PTL, um, Joe Olstein, um, um, Pat Robinson, I could go on and on and on with various ministries here in the Western world that have basically come forth in their own name, indicating that it was their ministry. The Windmill Ministries missions is not Dennis James Jackson's ministry. That was the name that God gave me to give the ministry that way there was no 
confounding, um, inappropriate misunderstandings that the windmill ministries was designed for the glory of God and not for the glory of Dennis James Jackson. And I don't know if people can see that and understand that and recognize that pertaining to the windmill ministries or not. But whenever my son and I went on our first crusade in 1989 and we went to Washington, D.C. and passed out material all over Northwest Tennessee and passed out material all over Harlem and and uh, and uh, Queens and, and basically the boroughs of New York, we wasn't doing that for us. We wasn't doing that for our recognition. We was doing that for the glory of God. Just like me dedicating my life for the past few years out here pertaining to the Purple Heart Dragon Memorial. That memorial is set aside for those who have died endless deaths. Regardless whether you was a veteran stationed in the military, or you were just a common old Joe out here pertaining to all the gun massacres and, and all the stuff that's went on, including Waco, Marco, um, um, Waco, Texas, Mount Karma, or Oklahoma, as well as 9-11, that that was built for them. Not for Dennis James Jackson, known as Yubi. It was built and designed for all our veterans, all our first responders, and for all of those who have endlessly died deaths that they shouldn't have had to have died under the hand of a maniac with a gun. I told you from the front of this broadcast to take these things lightly in sensitivity in not being so judgmental in the facts that the New York Times have now put out to the world in regards towards these plots of the Wall of Jericho that various people over in Israel, Jerusalem, was aware of. I don't know that they was aware of these things. Apparently, the New York Times believes that they that that they was aware of these things. But once more, it's one thing to know that you have an enemy, and it's another thing to know that your enemy is fixing to strike. I had no idea whenever I come back here in twenty and fourteen, leading up into the death of my brother in twenty and seventeen, that I was going to be attacked this way. If I knew without a shadow of a doubt that I was going to run into this type of resistances or complications in my life or or to the, to the degree that my younger brother was going to die because he was in the middle of this confrontation pertaining to him being collateral damage. If I know these things, do you really believe that I would have come back to Northwest Tennessee? I had already lived and been in about 30 different states from coast to coast on three different levels on three different times on my own dime. Nobody was supporting Dennis Jackson. Nobody was supporting the Windmill Ministries missions that I continue to tell people about to this day. The reason why that we're seeing the complications that has now arisen is because of those very facts. And if the truth be known, we should all right now be experiencing some form of utopia, prosperity, peace, love, grace, and mercy that comes out of the Bible. And I know whenever the Bible talks about peace, peace that compasses all understanding, that's talking about the peace of your mind and the peace of spirit. That's one form of peace. But the form of peace that it's talking about in the Bible, in chapter 6, in Revelations, verses 3 and 4 of the Red Horseman, is not the peace of mind. 
but rather it is a global international peace. That since I have stood out with this message of peace, I have seen the Western world go just the opposite direction in. More divorces, more suicides, more drug overdoses, more gun violence, more problems pertaining to our government and our courts, more problems pertaining to the church world that is, that is allowed for the sin to creep into their sanctuaries. Look at the Catholics. Look at all the Catholic uh, pedophiles that we've, that we've had to uh, witness just within, just within the past 25, 30 years. Look at the ministries that has come and, and gone, that has failed. Um, Jimmy Baker and Tammy Faye was one of them. Jimmy Swaggart's ministry uh, was, was made into a mockery pertaining to what that he got caught being married, messing around with a prostitute. Look at what went on with Bill Clinton and Monica Lewinsky. We have gone for the past 30 plus years in the opposite direction towards true peace and utopia. And if anybody argues that fact, I'll look at them and call them a barefaced liar. Just like I was talking to my, my, uh, I still call her my aunt, Aunt Ruth, that was married to Ronnie Jean, my dad's youngest brother, before they went through a divorce. He was a minister at the time. I explained to her very, very uh, thoroughly that the Bible says to rightly divide the scriptures that sometimes Christ was preaching on the fleshly perspective, sometimes Christ was preaching on the spiritual perspective, and sometimes Christ was talking about both at the same time. That's the reason why the only way for you to be able to truly interpret the Bible the way that God intended for you to interpret the Bible is for you to get in the same spirit that those people that wrote those prophecies of understanding the true, true interpretations of. And I use the example that whenever Christ, right before he got captured, one of his disciples pulled out an actual sword and cut off one of the Romans' ears, that Jesus reached down, grabbed the ear, put it on his head, and the ear instantaneously was healed on his head. Now, I know that whenever I say that, even the people that actually claim that they believe that unless they have seen true manifestations of miracles in other people's lives as well as their own, they're going to tell you that they believe that, but in reality, they really don't. Now, they'll tell you that they do. And there are a few of them out there that does tell you that they believe that actually are sincere because they know the power of God. They have seen manifestations like that occur. People's legs grow. People get up and walk. People being caught up in the spirit. People that should have died that didn't die. Even myself that should have already obtained death to the point of my carnal fleshly body where the worms would eat my body and basically I would be at naught in regards towards me still living. But I know that I know that I know that it's only by the hand and the power of God that I'm still living. So there are a few people that tell you that they know and that they believe that it was actual miracle that happened that day whenever Jesus reached down and grabbed the centurion's uh, ear and placed it back on his head and it was instantaneously healed. But that was talking about a physical carnal sword. You can read the scriptures to where it talks about a spiritual sword, and then you can read the scriptures to where it's talking about God himself coming back on a white horse that actually is a sword. So you got to be able to rightly divide the scriptures, and I use the example of, I think it was Einstein, that could actually look at seven different perspectives at the same time and give you an illustration of all seven pertaining to the same subject matter. And she commented on, well, that's above my pay grade, Dennis. I, I, 
<coughs> I just ain't built that way <coughs> to be able to break things down that way. She may not be. God bless her soul. She was a nurse all her life. She helped to preserve life and save life probably thousands of times. Um, you know, she, she told me that she's probably witnessed over, over a dozen or more deaths that wasn't actually family members because of her being associated with hospice and, and being a registered nurse that way. And she may have had qualifications of doing things that was unbelievable in the medical arena. But knowing that she was married to my uncle that was a minister... makes her more qualified in being able to understand the Bible, or I thought it was, up until just within a couple of days whenever me talking to her, understanding that she really doesn't have that, that ability to be able to take things and separate it in, in different perspectives. And you got to look at what has went on over there with this war, that maybe people was aware of these things, but they never thought that they was going to materialize to the degree of what they did. And now they've been caught blindsided, basically with their pants down. And now this leader of Israel wants to go into this, root hog or die. And if he's doing it inappropriately, it will take his own people to decipher that, number one, and it would take his own people, basically, to pull him out in regards to that. Now, there's no doubt his people is going to hold him responsible for him not being aware or at least not protecting the Jewish people because of what Hamas has done. But after they find out this, then they're going to be more prone of acting upon to that in a appropriate way I've said all along that nobody truly suffered other than the victims of the ones that should have been held liable for allowing for 9-11 to have ever occurred whenever I talk about the powers of the devil towards it being extreme even though want, people wanted to accuse me of me being extreme the supernatural powers are extreme. Regardless whether the supernatural powers come from, from the, the side of light or the supernatural powers come from the side of darkness, they are extreme. And if you don't have that ability to understand that, then odds are you're the one that's sucking hind tit. And people like myself are the ones that are on top of their game towards identifying these things. It's a gift. There are several fruits of the Spirit. There are several gifts of the Spirit. Not everybody is going to have the same gift. Not everybody's going to have the same fruit. But it does verify this, that those that are truly of the Lord's, that you will be able to recognize them by the fruits that they bear. And I don't think anybody can argue the fact that I have tried to help the Homo sapiens here up onto the planet especially here in the continental Western world in trying to give out advisories and warnings again and again and again that was obviously misinterpreted or misunderstood that leads us to where we are today, December the 1st, year 2023. Please listen to some more of this, please. Focusing on the West Bank for political purposes and the consequence for bringing in religious extremists and kicking out the professionals that had done such an extraordinary job in defending Israel for so long. Yeah, I mean, there are you know, far-right appointees in Netanyahu's cabinet who U.S. officials have told us they view as especially problematic. Ben Gavir is one of them. These are people who come from the settler movement, you know, that there's basically no hope for 
peace as long as you have people who are encouraging and arming settlers in the West Bank who are part of the cabinet. And U.S. officials have told us that they don't feel Netanyahu can make the right decisions for his country and sort of work in tandem with the U.S. on the goals of this war as long as he's constantly looking over his shoulder at what the right wing members of his cabinet are, are wanting. And so building on that, what does this story mean to the Biden administration as far as future support? I know they're going to support Israel, but are, are more strings attached yeah. now because of the sheer utter incompetence of Netanyahu's government? I think more strings are attached for numerous reasons. I mean, the, the incompetence of the government, the complete and utter security failure here to prevent this attack and then to respond once it began to unfold. And not only that, I think this week you've seen the Biden administration start to distance itself more and more from Israel and start to sort of put more conditions on U.S. support. They did not do this when uh, Israel began launching its attack in the north. They were very careful to not publicly criticize. They sort of indicated where they were yeah. uncomfortable, but very carefully. This week, they've said, we do not support an operation in the south until Israel presents us with a plan to protect civilians, to make sure more people are displaced. Um, an NSC official this week said, you know, Israel could just could not launch the types of attacks it was launching in northern Gaza because they could not sustain that kind of humanitarian disaster. And even yesterday at the briefing, John Kirk Kirby was saying, you know, we support, we don't, we want to see a plan from Israel before they go into the South, sort of, if they, you know, he was saying they hoped they, the pause would extend a couple more days and maybe would lead to a sort of more permanent cessation of, of hostility. So I think they have been positioning themselves to distance themselves from Israel if they start launching the types of airstrikes they were launching in the North. They just cannot sustain that. They can't support Israel. And not only that, now you have a number of Senate Democrats talking about conditioning aid to Israel. I think that Biden is trying to use all of these factors to really pressure Netanyahu to ignore the right wing of his cabinet, focus on bringing hostages home and finding a way to bring the war to an end. I, I, I want to repeat this again. And anybody who's watched the show, I, I know many people have been maddened by it. Now, what a strong supporter of Israel I am. Let me tell you something, though. The argument that falls on deaf ears now in America on Capitol Hill is an argument that many have made, which is Israel knows how to defend themselves better than anybody else. They well, the maybe example. the Israelis do, but Benjamin Netanyahu, it's been one mistake, Frank, after another, after another. He cynically played to ex right wing ex religious extremists or extreme settlers. Distracted by indictments. Distracted by indictments, went after the Supreme Court, and in doing all of this, he did it for political purposes only, and ignored the terrorists that said, we're coming yeah. to kill Jews. Yeah. Yeah. The worst, and, and let me, didn't respond. And, and, and let me just say, the worst slaughter of Jews since the Holocaust, and it took Netanyahu's government seven hours to even start going down to save them. And one can't be sure now, even after all of this. That and they're right about the carelessness of what went on, the gross negligence. But I, I reflect, <coughs> I reflect again <coughs> on the wolf story, the little boy that cried wolf. He cried wolf, the people come. There was no danger. The little boy done it again. The people come. And there was no danger. The way I understand the fairy tale is that that happened three times. And the fourth time, whenever the little boy really was in trouble, he cried wolf and nobody come. You know why? Because the people had made up their minds that this guy is a trickster and there's no need of listening to him because he's just thriving for attention. And whenever the time come that he really did need help, there was no help because the little boy had done already ruined his credibility by being a trickster. It basically is under the same pretense of people over in the Middle East, the Holy Land, Israel, Knowing that they don't just have one enemy, but they have probably almost a hundred different nationalities over there that are against them.
that want them dead. They've known that now for thousands of years. It's, it's, it's not no hidden secret that God's chosen people, his elect, has been persecuted. Even their main leader, the Savior, Jesus Christ, which is my inspiration, which is my leader, he himself was giving out advisories and warnings of what was going to occur before it ever occurred. You go back to Mr. Putin over in Russia. Thank God that it was through the Holy Spirit that opened the eyes of Ronald Reagan, that Ronald Reagan seen through the BS that was going on over in Russia in the old Yugoslavia government that called them out and told them that their regime, their empire, was evil. Now, 30 some odd years later, we understand what Ronald Reagan was talking about pertaining to the Russian government being evil. Because you have to put them in the same category as being nothing but cold-blooded terrorist. A group of people that's willing to bomb citizens, defenseless citizens, in bombing hospitals, maternity wards, communities that didn't have nothing to do with the actual war front. War has never been. War, I'm going to repeat it. War has never been a glorious thing to look at. But it was the demonic kingdom that struck the first lick, that throwed the first blow in provoking God in defending his kingdom and in God defending his children. And if people don't want to accept that and understand that, there's really nothing else that I can do other than tell them that what has befallen up into their lives, they basically had it coming because they turn their backs on the Savior. The Bible is very clear in telling us that whenever we shall see Jerusalem accomplished with armies to know that the end is nigh, which means at hand. And if people hasn't made proper reservations in their own lives, that get a hold of my material in making sure that you're prayed up, packed up, and ready to go up, regardless whether it comes in the form of a heart attack, a, an accident out here on the road, a drive-by, uh, being at the wrong place at the wrong time, or a nuclear war, or us being attacked by, by, by domestic or even um, foreign enemies, that... You need to be prepared because at any given time, there is no guarantees that our lives will be preserved for another day. That's the reason why it is so critical to thank God every day. The day that you wake up, you know that God has saved you and given you another day to reach out there and possibly help somebody or help to influence somebody in the right way of leading them to the Lord. The same way that you and myself was led to the Lord. Because there was a time, at one time, that I was just as dark. I was just as confused. I was just as dim-witted. I was just as deceived as they was towards not accepting who Jesus Christ actually said that Jesus Christ was. And I'm pretty sure that that goes along with all of us to some degree. That we was blinded regardless whether we was blinded because of doubt, <coughs> regardless whether we was blinded because of, of greed, regardless whether we was blinded because of <coughs> whatever, I'm pretty sure that most everybody can state the fact that at one time, even if you got saved whenever you were just six or seven years old, <coughs> there was still a time that you wasn't saved. There was still a time that you was blinded. <coughs> It goes back of what they're talking about right now 
<coughs> pertaining to the wolf and the little boy. <coughs> they let their guard down. Yeah, who still isn't acting <coughs> simply to extend various parts of the conflict or to neglect various parts of the diplomacy in order to preserve himself. I think Biden is actually pretty clear-eyed in the end about Netanyahu, despite his ability to... <laughs> it was an awkward bear hug. It was an awkward... It was, that was a one-sided... I've seen the one-sided <laughs> bear hugs. That was a yeah. one-sided yeah. bear hug. I'm going to be talking... But he's also, I think, reluctant to meddle too deeply inside the politics uh, the politics of another nation. Well, certainly not right after a terror attack. Certainly yeah. not right after a terror attack. Right. But, but now... But, but there are... Yes. I mean, and, and given Netanyahu's unpopularity... <laughs> Uh, given the likelihood that everybody knows that his government is going to fall at some point. It's a question of when and what the triggering mechanism is for that. Uh, Benny Gantz, who is an opposition uh, politician mm -hmm. who joined the war cabinet. So there's not a coalition government, but right. there is a war cabinet that included right. some members of the opposition. I think at some point, I'm, I'm just speculating here. I mean, I, I think that he, I've heard that he's been frustrated with Netanyahu's uh, prosecution of the war. At some point, he has to make a decision about how much more cover he can provide for Netanyahu, given these failures, given the fact that it's, it's actually hard to know how the war is going in terms of the actual elimination of Hamas, which is the end one of the end goals of the operation and how, how much of Hamas has actually been destroyed in the course of the operation. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a relatively open question. We don't have great reporting on that at this stage, but it's an essential question. I, 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 you also got to look at Belinsky, the leader of the Ukraine, of their army, their forces, that they was convinced because of a lie that Putin's government was putting out that what they was doing was strictly a routine in surrounding their country with, I believe, if I'm not mistaken, over 5,000 tanks, not counting all the people that they kept telling them that this was an exercise, this was an exercise. It was only up until the last stages of that within a 24-hour period, was whenever they realized that this was not an exercise that these people was fixing. They was fixing to uh, go to war with you. And I and some, and some other people that was witnessing all this was putting out dire warnings that it's coming, it's coming, it's coming. And guess what? It came. A matter of fact, it was my brother and I in 2015 after I'd already come here that was paying close attention to the national news in regards towards the Russians wanting to find another trading route somewhere up in the Atlantic, uh, up in North Pole somewhere. And, and my brother and I was smart enough, once more giving God the credit, that we started asking the questions, well, what's wrong with the old trading route? How come they're, they're looking for a different trading route? Well, see, at that time in 2015, this was after they'd done already had a skirmish with, with the Ukrainians. They was already plotting for another attack. Because if they wasn't, they wouldn't have been concerned about a different trading route. To be able to bring in supplies to their own people. They knew what they was fixing to do to the Ukrainians in 2015. How can people be so naive? Well, at one time, we all was naive. At one time, we was all blinded. At one time, if we didn't have the gifts of the Holy Spirit to alert us and tell us ahead of time what was coming down the pike, we was caught blindsided. And that's what happened to America in 9-11. That's what happened to America pertaining to Pearl Harbor, and that's now what's happened to the Ukrainians, and that's now what's happened to the people over in Israel. So why should it be so alarming? Well, let their own people decide within their own administration, within their own 
government, just like the people over in Russia. Eventually, they're going to have to make a choice. Do we continue to follow under the leadership of this madman that Ronald Reagan pegged over 30 plus years ago whenever he had accused their government of being an evil empire? Are they going to continue to follow under those same rules? Are they going to stand up? And are they going to change from within? Because that's what it takes for a communist-controlled country to ever want to become a true Democrat country. It has to basically come from within. And the reason why that I know this, which is a pure mere illustration, we thought that we had convinced the Afghanistan people that democracy was the best path and they we had trained them and told them everything to do if there was a movement in there towards towards a, uh, something bad and what did they do what did they do they laid down and they took it they gave in to the terrorist group over there less than 12 days from the time we left so once more, you cannot reform a group of people from the outside in. You have to reform them from the inside out. And the only thing that can do that is God, the Holy Spirit, the Lord Jesus Christ, and the fact that people are willing to change. And if they're not willing to change, then odds are they'll be just like the Afghanistan women and little kids, they'll know that their adults, their leadership, let them down. America didn't let Afghanistan down. Their own people let their own people down because they did not stand up against that evil demonic regime. Uh, just on that point, I mean, I think it's worth noting the Biden administration never thought this war was going to be successful in eradicating Hamas. From the very beginning, U.S. officials were privately saying they thought Israel's uh, strategy was faulty, that they couldn't eradicate Hamas. A lot of experts were saying you should try to, um, you know, eliminating them is an unrealistic goal. You should try to weaken them and, and bring in new leadership. But this, this goal of like full annihilation, elimination was always unrealistic. They never thought the ground invasion was a good idea. They did not agree with the airstrikes. I mean, now more than 13,000 Palestinians have been killed because of this. They don't think the operation in the South is going to be successful. So I just think it's worth noting there's been a lot of skepticism and distrust of this military strategy from the beginning. Well, the administration is now going to continue to pressure even more so than they have been before, probably even more publicly. What happens after this is over? Whenever that is, right? What does the day after actually look like? Not just show us your you know, what you're going to do in the South, not just show us what the rest of this looks like. They're, they have clearly been doing that. But also, what are you doing after? What does it actually look like? What's the end game? What's the end game? Because you got to look at it that way towards being a organizer. They're not sure how the, you know, talking, saying that the Middle Eastern countries are going to take care of it. Those countries don't want to do that. And so what does that actually look like? And Vice President Harris is in the Middle East this weekend. And I assume that those conversations are going to start happening. Very it, it also creates more political headaches on this issue for President Biden. I mean, as you were just articulating, you can be a very strong supporter of Israel, but be very critical of the Netanyahu government. But that's a slightly more nuanced and complicated position to hold. You can be a very strong supporter of Israel and also be morally outraged and say it's unacceptable that 13,000 Palestinians, largely women and children, have been killed um, by Israel's invasion. Um, but, but what you are seeing is all of these things that are kind of hard to hold in your yes. mind at one point are exposing fissures in the Democratic Party that President Biden has to deal with at a time when he wants his attention elsewhere. What does the Bible say about the devil? He's the author of confusion. So you got to be smart enough as a leader to look through all this, all this smoke screen and identify what's going on, who's in behind it, and act accordingly. And, and and I think that's the argument to be made, that pressuring Israel 
to stop fomenting chaos in the West Bank is not only in the Palestinians' best interest, yeah. it's in Israel's military best interest. Getting Now that I agree with. What he just said, I agree with 100%. It's in their best interest to work out some sort of a compromising agreement, though they may not want to at this particular time, either or, maybe both sides. The fact of the matter is, it would be to their best interest if they could live in peace rather than live in war. That's that way with any community or any country or any opposing forces. That's that way with people in general. You got to be able to understand that we're all not alike. And it's and the Bible is very clear in stating that he wants the wheat to grow with the tares until time of harvest. It's the evil, demonic, wicked people that want to take out the good people. But don't be alarmed at this because they've been trying to do this now from day one. From day one. And sometimes it takes a liberator, somebody like Moses, to go up to the pharaohs and say, let my people go. And if you don't let my people go, these are the consequences that's going to happen to you. It took 10 times. And every time, the severity got a little worse and a little worse and a little worse until finally the death of all the Pharisees firstborn occurred. And it wasn't until then that the Pharaoh knew that Moses' God was in fact the righteous holy God, the only true God that could overpower all of their so-called gods. But even then, that was only effective for a certain length of time because after Moses redeemed his own people by being a liberator and getting them out of bondage, here come the Pharaoh army again. That God basically had to kill all of them. Other than Pharaoh, they come back to his wife and there was not no blood on his sword, especially Moses' blood, that his own wife demanded of him. He was a complete, total failure in not only the eyes of Moses' people, but the eyes of his own people. Pharaoh was a complete, total failure. Leaders in, you said Benny Gantz, getting leaders in to actually know what the hell they're doing is not only uh, in the Palestinians' best interest, yeah. civilians, it's in Israel's best interest. As you said, like Joe Biden said, Frank, from the very beginning, and the Biden administration said from the very beginning, this is going to be extraordinarily difficult. So how do you keep supporting one of the most incompetent leaders, if not the most incompetent leader in Israeli history? And one of the interesting things that's happened in Israel, in the immediate aftermath of the attack, I started to call around to uh, various people within the Israeli uh, military establishment, smart strategic thinkers in Israel, to ask, how does this end? Where does this go? What's, what's the strategy? And all of them were capable of articulating strategies, but they also said that the major obstacle to that was the Netanyahu government, because not just because of the incompetence. These were Israelis. Of, Israelis, not just because of the, incom the, the smartest, Right. You know, people who serve former prime ministers right. because of the incompetence of the ministers that he has appointed, but also Bibi's inability to talk about the two-state solution. Also, his inability to uh, to make the sorts of uh, concessions in the conversations that he needs to have with the Gulf states and the other Arab states that would be capable of reconstructing Gaza and taking some sort of leadership role in the end. And so the question is really, Given what's transpired so far, where does this go from here? Right.
And, and, and I'm so glad Frank brought up the Gulf states and the yeah. Arab states because the leaders there yeah. are quietly saying, yeah. we want to have relations with Israel. The longer this drags on, the way it is going, the way yeah. the Netanyahu government is executing this war makes it harder by the day. Absolutely. White House reporter for The Washington Post, Jasmine Nebutalib, thank you so much thank for coming you. on. Come back, please. Uh, Ashley Eugene Frank, stay with us if you can. Coming up, we talked a lot about the major tensions on college campuses, as well as the backlash for business and other institutions for either taking stances on the Israel-Hamas war, or in some cases, not taking one, saying nothing at all. Up next, we'll get a report on how the war is causing some divisions within the Hollywood community. I'm also going to be talking about the tragic shootings in Vermont with the head of the Anti-Defamation League, Jonathan Greenplatt. Just sickening, sickening developments uh, in those shootings of three Muslim students, three Palestinian students. Uh, Jonathan will join the conversation next. You're watching Morning Joe. We'll be right back. See, the concept sounds good towards going to destroy evil. But in reality, what is it going to take to do that the way that they're trying to do that with bombs and artillery shells? It's going to be a long, lengthy war is what's going to occur. And ultimately, Between is ultimately, before it's all said and done with, both sides are going to sustain significantly hardship. Let's bring in a... Because rather than trying to work things out on a verbal scale, they wanted to work things out on a military scale. And I've said all along, you're not going to be able to conform the devil and the devil's people. The only thing that you can do is let them know ahead of time that if they attack you, if they hurt you, that harm and hurt is going to come back sevenfold every time because you have purposely targeted the good people while being disguised by trying to convince everybody else that you was good, but in reality, you wasn't a good person. You was the bad because you responded in a bad way. That goes back to my cousins, the James gang. Their father was a minister. They knowed what had happened in their lives was wrong pertaining to Illinois Central Railroad. That costed them, I believe, their mother of a riot. Rather than them lay it on the altar and say, all right, God, you're going to have to handle this. They took it upon to themselves to handle it. And whenever they did, we read about what actually happened to Jesse James and the James gang in response to that. There does come a time, and this is the fine line. There does come a time to where the only way to abolish bad or eradicate the element of bad towards it attacking you is just like the president of the NRA continues to keep saying that the only way to defeat a bad person with a gun is with a good person with a gun. And I'll even go a step further than that to say that bad things happen to good people. And sometimes good people does have to initiate bad things, even though they don't want to, to be able to convince the bad that they're not just going to sit back and take it like somebody's floor mat or somebody's whipping post. Because I guarantee you, every one of them people that pursued in that in that um, <clears throat> in that arena, in that atmosphere of killing Jesus Christ, paid 
severely for that. And during the time that they was getting paid for that, they knew the reason why that that hardship had fallen upon to them, those people's lives. They knew. And I guarantee you, it come back at them sevenfold, just like it come back at the Pharaohs, just like it's going to come back on the Antichrist, Lucifer himself. This is news entertainment correspondent Chloe Malas with the details on this. Chloe. Good morning, Mika. Hollywood is no stranger for taking a stand publicly on current controversial issues, but this one has people divided on what is free speech and what is hate speech, and the repercussions for going too far could mean being dropped by an agency or even losing your job. Nearly two months into the war between Israel and Hamas, the world is divided. Tensions mounting in D.C. On college campuses and in Hollywood. In the days following the October 7th terrorist attacks on Israel, companies including Disney, Paramount and Comcast, the parent company of NBC News, condemned the acts. Celebrities, including Juliana Margulies and Natalie Portman, posted messages of solidarity with Israel on social media. And Michael Douglas and Jerry Seinfeld were among 700 actors, writers, and directors who penned an open letter in support for Israel. But since then, as images captured the devastation in Gaza, some began posting support for Palestinians, including models Gigi and Bella Hadid. The divisions have grown in Hollywood. Some have faced fallout for taking public stands on either side of the conflict. Angry comments filled Amy Schumer's social media after she posted support for Israel, some taking issue with clips that she shared of Martin Luther King Jr. backing the country in 1967. Can I show you something? Critics called for a boycott of the Netflix show Stranger Things after actor Noah Schnapp posted a video laughing with friends, holding stickers that read, Zionism is sexy and Hamas is ISIS. <laughs> Last week, United Talent Agency dropped actress and activist Susan Sarandon after she spoke at a pro-Palestinian rally in New York, telling the crowd that Jewish people are, quote, getting a taste of what it feels like to be a Muslim in this country. Both declined to comment. Who is this? Hello, Samantha. Did you miss me? And Melissa Barrera was fired from the latest Scream film after she condemned Israel for its strikes in Gaza in a series of Instagram posts. Barrera later said on social media, I am against anti-Semitism. I am against Islamophobia. Spyglass Entertainment, the company behind the franchise, said in a statement, we have zero tolerance for anti-Semitism or the incitement of hate in any form. Fear of retaliation is palpable. More than 400 Hollywood workers signed an anonymous letter calling for a ceasefire using only their initials. In a statement, they explained that decision, saying this is amounting to a new era of McCarthyism. I think Hollywood is going to have a reckoning or is in need of a reckoning. Seema Yasmin, a doctor and author who frequently appears on television, says she was dropped by her talent agency A3 after she called Israel's actions towards Palestinians genocide on social media. I was sent a very vaguely worded email that said points of view were respected but within reason. A3 has not responded to requests for comment. Of course there are lines to draw. Uh, there are such things as hate speech. Uh, I think that's different than free speech. Modi Widjik, the chairman of Media Rights Capital, the studio behind Ozark and Knives Out, says Hollywood's struggle is deciding what counts as free speech and what goes too far. Organizations are trying to figure out what those lines are for them, and you're seeing that get worked out. Hollywood has a long history of wrestling with controversial political issues. From the notorious Red Scare after World War II, when hundreds of Hollywood stars were suspected of being communists and temporarily blacklisted. Two decades later, when actress Jane Fonda sparked outrage after she was photographed in Hanoi during the Vietnam War, sitting alongside North Vietnamese troops, earning her the nickname Hanoi Jane. I will go to my grave regretting the fact that I was photographed sitting on an anti-aircraft gun. And now today, another war has tensions running high. Certainly, uh, we have seen a, a polarization in uh, issues about international affairs. But this does seem to be a particularly uh, difficult one in many respects. Uh, emotions are raw. 
and a follow-up to some of those examples that we just showed you. Model Gigi Hadid has been facing mounting backlash for an Instagram post Monday where she inaccurately said Israel is the only country in the world that keeps children as prisoners of war. In response, entertainment executive Scooter Braun said on his Instagram story, quote, let's get our facts straight before we post to 78 million people. Hadid has since posted an apology for her comments, saying that she failed to, quote, fact check and that she does not stand behind the spreading of misinformation. But she does say that she'll continue to speak out in support of Palestinians. Also, Juliana Margulies, who we told you earlier has been a vocal supporter of Israel, is seeing her own backlash this morning after her comments on a podcast went viral. The actress said that the black community was, quote, brainwashed to hate Jews and that if LGBTQ people were to enter an Islamic country, they would be beheaded and, quote, played with like a soccer ball. Representatives for the actress have not responded to multiple outlets request for comment. Mika? Oh my gosh. NBC correspondent Chloe Malas, thank you very much for that report. We really appreciate it. Joining us now, and we definitely need to hear from him, uh, the CEO of Anti-Defamation League, Jonathan Greenblatt. Jo wow. Jonathan, let's, um, be, let's be very clear here, and, I, and, and maybe you can help with, uh, it's you know, it's going to be impossible to draw a line that everybody's going to agree with. It is okay to come out in support of Palestinians. Coming out in support of Palestinians is not support of Hamas, is not support of, of, of terrorism. That can be done. Uh, what we have seen, unfortunately, from some in Hollywood has gone far beyond that. But I just want to say, I, 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 I've seen some posts yeah. that have been attacking people for simply supporting Palestinians. Yeah. Look. Joe. That is, that is, that is, they should not be attacked for that. That is far so. different than, than a, a providing aid and comfort to Hamas. A, a hundred percent. We have a moral obligation as human beings to say Palestinian civilians should never be killed. Now, we can argue about the causality to a certain degree in terms of Hamas's tactics, but let's be clear saying that about talking about the dignity of Palestinian people, we have a moral obligation to do that. We have a moral obligation to call out these three young men who were shot in Burlington in what appears to me to be a hate oh crime. My God. So Just terrible. like we should be calling out the, you know, the Jewish elderly man who was bludgeoned to death in Israel. I, or excuse me, in Los Angeles at a pro-Israel rally. So I don't understand why people feel the need to deny the humanity of others. And at the same time, you know, uh, Susan Sarandon's not exactly, you know, David Ignatius, right? No. Like, I, I mean, and so when she makes claims and she posts things on social media that Israel's committing genocide, that it's lying about the murder of civilians, uh. I wouldn't go to Gigi Hadid, you know, to no. write a column in the New York Times. So I think we need to acknowledge that celebrities do have a kind of reach and a kind of power and influence, which makes when they get it wrong, it really reverberates. But that should not impede our ability to understand, again, the dignity of Palestinian civilians and the innocence of Israeli lives too. Like we should yeah. call out anti-Semitism when it happens. We should call out anti-Muslim hate when it happens. And we should do it full stop without qualifications. Uh, Jonathan, uh, part of the problem is, you know, early on in this conflict, we saw a lot of people afraid to speak out, actually in support of the Jewish people who had been yeah. slaughtered for a lot of different reasons. Uh, we on this show, and I know I talked to you about it a lot, we talked about presidents of universities, we talked about yeah. administrators at universities, but the longer we get into this, and the more I talk to my own children and my children's friends, I've got to say, you kind of hit the nail on the head right there. It's not college presidents who are influencing students so much as it is Instagram and TikTok. And yeah, so when somebody, and with, had when somebody with 75, 80 million followers says yeah. something, uh, you know, they're not a lot of people, a lot of, a lot of younger people who know nothing about this conflict. They hear something from a celebrity they're going to take it in, and they're not going to hear the correction five days later. That's correct. That's correct. And, like, let's be frank about it. We've been on this show. We've talked about Instagram. We've talked about Twitter or X, and you've seen my back and forth with Elon Musk. But we need to talk about TikTok. 
TikTok, if yes. you will. Oh. It is the is the 24-7 news channel of so many of our young people, and it's like Al Jazeera on steroids, amplifying and intensifying the anti-Semitism and the anti-Zion with no repercussions. I've got to ask, Joe, like there's been a lot of lamentations about the fact that TikTok's ownership is Chinese, but you know what? Oracle owns 10% of the company. General Atlantic owns a piece of the company. Um, our friends at Sequoia Capital own a piece of the company. So does Sequoia and General Atlantic, does Oracle want to be responsible for spreading anti-Zionism and anti-Semitism? It's time to talk about TikTok. And I think we yes. need members of Congress to be asking them, why are they doing it up? And let me be clear, I've met with Sho Chu, the CEO. I've talked to their leadership. But it is long past time for TikTok and its owners and its investors to step up and say, enough, we're going to take action. Yeah. Frank, Frank Ford, do you have teenage kids? I do. So you know what I'm talking about. Yeah. Like, it is amazing what our, our children, what their friends, what younger people are getting, the unfiltered anti-Semitic bile that they're getting every day off of TikTok. And again, I didn't understand what was going on college campuses, why it was happening. Yeah. If you don't understand what's going on in college campus, don't look at the University of Penn, right? Look at TikTok. I mean, that's so where this is. It makes me despair for the world that they're going to inhabit. Just the low quality of the informational ecosystem in which they exist, where uh, demagoguery, misinformation circulates like oxygen. And it also makes me despair for the ways in which they debate one, one another, that they're yes. just incapable of expressing disagreement without resorting to hyperbole. And also the right. way in which everybody is forced to take sides about an issue which, which most people have exceedingly low knowledge, it's which just, is why you get so extraordinarily ignorant on this issue. And I'm not, I'm not, I don't say that about a lot of issues, but on the Middle East, yeah. you know, people who have no idea what's been going on since 1948 yeah. will look at a 30 second clip and yeah. then they'll become and experts and determined. march across the college yeah. campus. They'll take over the building oh, based on a TikTok. Right, right, so so TikTok. Jonathan mentioned the horrific shooting in Vermont of three college students of Palestinian descent, and we're now learning more about the suspect and hearing from the mothers of two of the victims. NBC News correspondent Stephanie Gosk has more. The suspect accused of shooting three Palestinian college students in Burlington, Vermont, has not been charged with a hate crime. But the mothers of two of the young men say they have no doubt why their sons were targeted. If they were not wearing the keffiyeh, right, if they were not speaking Arabic, I seriously cannot understand in any logical sense why he would pull out a gun and shoot. Elizabeth Price and Tamara Tamimi's yeah. sons, Hisham and Kanan, were shot Saturday evening, along with their friend, Tassim. Kanan is out of the hospital, but rattled. He's a bit jumpy. He's frightful. He's traumatized. He is. Yeah. He absolutely is. Hisham is seriously wounded. He is paralyzed, currently paralyzed, um, from mid-torso downwards. 48-year-old Jason Eaton pleaded not guilty to three charges of attempted murder. In 2019, a former girlfriend told police he had a history of mental illness, according to police records reviewed by NBC News. He was fully accountable. He had a gun, um, and he uh, tried to take the lives of our sons. Elizabeth says Hisham appreciates all the support, but worries about Palestinians at home. He said that of the uh, thousands, the tens of thousands of people killed in Gaza, there were about 30 that had the name Hisham. Both mothers say their sons felt the effect of toxic rhetoric on their campuses since the war began. I think that as the Palestinian um, people see them as culpable and accountable. But from their homes in the West Bank, they hoped their children were safe in the U.S. I was and am incredibly angry that I feel like there's nowhere safe for Palestinians. I literally don't know where to go with my son. Oh. The, 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 and these three young men, I almost said Jonathan boys because yeah. they're the age of my yes. sons. And they're so heartbreaking. Just in Burlington, Vermont. For in Burlington, Vermont. And you know, I'm, to Burlington, I'm so heartbroken for them. Burlington. I'm so heartbroken for them. I'm so heartbroken for their parents. And I'm so heartbroken that this could happen 
in America. Anywhere. Yeah. It, yeah. It, it is horrifying, Jonathan. Anyone who thinks that shooting teenagers in Burlington, Vermont is going to help Israel is nuts. Just like anyone who thinks yeah. that intimidating and terrorizing college students because they're wearing Stars of David is going to help a single Palestinian is nuts. Like, it feels like the tension is so high, Mika and Joe. We need leaders to just dial it down. Stop making wild accusations. Call out hate when it happens. That's all it takes. And yet, I don't know, you know, these university presidents you mentioned, Joe, the cowardice. Next week, the presidents of Harvard, Penn, and MIT are being compelled to testify before Congress and to explain how things have unraveled to such an extent that we have Jewish students being assaulted this past week at Ohio State, at University of Massachusetts. There was a referendum this week at Michigan about Israel committing genocide. We need presidents to say whether you are Jewish or Muslim, all our students are entitled to an education without fear of violence or reprisals of any kind. Do you know what you call Jewish students and Muslim students? Americans. Yes. And yes. the idea, the idea that, that you have politicians that are trying to divide America over this, that you have, I will say, college presidents who um, uh, have been uh, cowards in so many respects. It's just, it's heartbreaking. Uh, Muslim students, Jewish students have to be protected. Yes, they do. Have to be protected. Once again, CEO of the Anti-Defamation League, Jonathan Greenblatt. Thanks. It's always great to have you on Thank these you so Fridays. Much. Thank you very much. And still ahead, White House reporter for the Wall Street Journal, Ken Thomas, joins us with his latest reporting on the hand-wringing that is happening from some Democrats about Biden's re-election campaign. Well, and hey, that's, that's, like, nicer than bedwetting. Yes. We've been hearing bad wedding. I think, I think we should tell all of our guests we're substituting that with hand wringing. Very nice. Very and nice. as we go to break, this programming note on Sunday, MSNBC Films presents an NBC News studio production entitled Between Life and Death. The documentary retraces the tragic story of Terry Schiavo going beyond the headlines of the national debate over her life that reverberates in today's culture wars. Here's a look at the film's trailer. The battle over Terry Schiavo has come to involve state judges, federal judges, the Supreme Court, the Congress, and even the President of the United States. I remember them telling us that she was going to have a significant brain injury. No interaction, unable to communicate in any way. She had no living will. She had no health care surrogate. She was there. She could hear me. She knew I loved her. I had a meeting with all the doctors, and they said, this is Terry. There's nothing more they can do for her. The feeling she was keeping her alive. Then Michael was trying to actively end Terry's life to kill her. In Florida, you have the legal right to die with dignity. If she dies, there is going to be hell to pay. Throughout this whole thing, Terry Schiavo became a poster child for every cause. Anita. Between Life and Death, Terry Schiavo's story premieres this Sunday night at 10 Eastern on MSNBC and streaming on Peacock. We'll be right back with much more Morning Joe. He hits his mark center stage and is crushed by a baby grand piano. You're replacing me? Customize and save with Liberty Biberty. He doesn't even have a mustache. Only pay for what you need. Liberty, 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 Liberty. Hard to rep, easy to give. Right now, save $40 on the HSA 45 battery hedge trimmer. Real steel. Find yours. I've said all along that the devil has come down just like the scripture says in great wrath because it knoweth his time is short. Hang on. Back up right here for a second. This will be interesting. 
shop. That Garrett was talking about comes out, gives new momentum to the push to expel him and brings us to today. We will see, do uh, two thirds of the members, if all 435 are there and voting, that'd be 290 votes uh, that, that would be needed, but we're not sure how many will be there, how many will actually be voting in this. Bigger picture context though, when we say rare, this is how rare, five times in the history of the United States has a member of the House been expelled. And the, talk about some extreme circumstances here. The first three, you see, 1861, 1861, 1861. These are three members of the House who took up arms against the United States of America. They fought for the Confederacy or for Confederate-aligned militias. As a result, they were expelled from the House. The two others, these are more recent. 1981, there was Michael Myers from Pennsylvania. Uh, he was caught in the ab scam scandal. That was undercover FBI agents who did basically sting operations. Uh, Myers accepted from them a $50,000 bribe. He was convicted. He was expelled. He did try to run in the 1980 election. He was defeated, by the way, as a footnote. Myers is still alive, still around and is in prison now because he was convicted on election fraud charges in Pennsylvania just about six a year ago. So interesting footnote on that one. And then the most recent, Jim Trafficant, Ohio, 2002, he had been convicted on federal charges of bribery, of tax evasion, racketeering, the vote there, 420 to one. That is the most recent. Santos would join this company if he is expelled today. There are a couple of other failed expulsion votes. This is a, the, the company that Santos would join if this vote fails today. Again, extraordinary circumstances in a lot of these. Preston Brooks, this is the South Carolina representative who was offended in 1856 by a, a northern senator, Charles Sumner from Massachusetts. The issue on slavery, Preston Brooks went into the Senate chamber, found Sumner, and caned him nearly to death. Uh, there was a motion to expel him it, it failed. Brooks resigned his seat, so I'll let the uh, uh, South Carolina voters decide my fate. They sent him back to the House. Again, Russo from Kentucky in uh, 1866 assaulting another member of the House faced an expulsion vote. It also failed. And the only other modern expulsion vote was in 1990. That was Barney Frank from Massachusetts. It failed overwhelmingly. The circumstances were a bit complicated, but essentially he had a relationship with a male prostitute. And the accusations were about were, was Frank using his office uh, to help in a variety of ways uh, um, uh, in a violation of his, uh, of his uh, of oath and of, of his office. So uh, that one failed overwhelmingly. He was simply <laughs> reprimanded, reelected, served 20 more years in the House. Okay, thank you for giving us that backdrop, this foundation <coughs> precedent for what we are about to witness any moment now. <coughs> wow. Explaining <coughs> <coughs> this very small group of individuals who've been expelled from the house. <coughs> <coughs> Keep going. Keep going. Congressional district no longer have representation. Uh, all the rights and privileges that are afforded a member of Congress, he lost at that exact moment. So what will happen now uh, is that his congressional office Ryan. will be run essentially by the clerk of the House. Yep. If I could interrupt you really quickly, I understand that Representatives Garcia and Goldman, Democrats are not speaking. Let's go to them. On what you just saw happen today. Well, my take is that uh, New York has been broadly, beyond just the District uh, 3, has been clamoring for George Santos to be removed from Congress since January. Uh, we had members of uh, New York 3 come down this morning and talk about how they thought that he would be removed in January because his conduct was so obvious and so egregious to defraud the voters of the 3rd District of New York. But all of the New York Party supported George Santos, the Republican Party. Uh, they all wrapped their arms around him. There's a lot of interlocking 
um, connections between the Republican members in New York and George Santos. Um, and they tried to protect him for as long as they could to preserve their political power and their slim majority, um, and also potentially to save themselves uh, from further uh, discredit. And let me also remind folks that we, we started this, um, uh, Dan and I, um, nine months ago. And so this, this, is a, this has been a, something we've been focused on from day one. I think we both believe that integrity in the U.S. House of Representatives is incredibly important. So nine months ago, Forcing that first expulsion, making sure that it went to the Health Ethics Committee. The report came out. I think overall, um, it's still disappointing how many Republicans, especially Mike Johnson, uh, refused to actually do the right thing. And I think this is actually a horrific vote that shows his leadership in the future and just how, um, I think, little moral center he has on an issue like this. Um, but the other Republicans, obviously, we, all had, we had a pretty almost united Democratic uh, coalition and caucus. Um, and it's, it is a sad day, but George Santos now needs to go and focus on the bigger issues he has, which is his 32 count indictment that he has ahead of him uh, in the months ahead. So and I, I would just add that, um, that I would add that the 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 fa ultimately this should never have been a partisan issue, right. whether or not someone uh, has the proper moral clarity, the integrity, follows the rules, and uh, therefore can justly vote on legislation, can see classified information, can serve the American people, is not based on whether or not they're Republican or Democratic. And it is too bad that the Republicans, even to this day, um, where more than half of them voted to protect George Santos, view this as purely a partisan issue. It is an issue of right and wrong, it is an issue of integrity, it is an issue of democracy, whether voters should be able to be deceived in order for someone to assume the power of a member of Congress is not a Republican or Democratic issue. It should not be, but unfortunately for the Republicans, it has been. Representatives uh, Garcia and Goldman, uh, Democrats who were uh, very much behind the process to create a system by which Congressman, now former Congressman, um, Santos could be expelled. I want to go back to Ryan Nobles and, and Ryan, we were just chatting. Former Congressman is no longer a Congressman. See how far this is going to go with this. Some of the work that they have done, but still on it. Bought a cease fight. out the U.S.'s shifting position. It also reports Hamas terrorists are willing to give up American hostages whose release has been withheld because their captors view them as strategic assets, which could provide leverage for securing a future ceasefire or other concessions now that fighting has resumed. At least seven Americans are still among those hostages being held in Gaza. Uh, and Nate Foy is standing by live for us on the ground in northern Israel with the very latest on this. So, Nate, let's do southern Israel and everything that's going on, and then I want to hit northern Israel with some breaking news up there. Hey, Harris, uh, it's certainly feeling like a war zone. You mentioned what's happening in southern Israel, where uh, the IDF has struck 200 terrorist targets within Gaza, and rockets are coming out of Gaza by Hamas terrorists across Israel as well, southern and central Israel, including Tel Aviv in the past couple hours, a barrage of rockets launched there. Uh, every single one of them was intercepted. Uh, and you mentioned uh, a lot of activity here on the northern front as well. Uh, the Iron Dome intercepted two launches coming into northern Israel from Lebanon, fired by Hezbollah terrorists, and we actually captured the moment that happened. Uh, let's show you that if we can.
coming from Israel going back into Lebanon. And take a look at this next video. Uh, the IDF has also confirmed that they have struck a terrorist cell in Zarit. That is just across the mountain range uh, in Lebanon from where we are right now. Uh, the IDF chief of staff was in northern Israel earlier this week saying that when residents return to these evacuated villages where we are, they will have a much improved security situation compared to what they had uh, on October 7th. Let's also show you the moment that it became clear this temporary ceasefire was over. Uh, take a look at these scenes from Gaza this morning. Uh, I mentioned that the IDF has hit over 200 uh, <laughs> terrorist targets there. Uh, they have hit multiple areas, Israeli jets did, including Han Yunus. Uh, if we can show you some video from there as the IDF has dropped leaflets telling Palestinians to go to certain evacuation zones. Uh, but unfortunately, you can see in the video that many of them uh, did not, and there is certainly a lot of damage there. Also now, as the ceasefire is over, we know that more Israeli hostages will not be coming home. Uh, over 130 hostages remain in Gaza. Uh, and, of course, right now, the IDF says that they are continuing in their push to eradicate Hamas, their, their goals not only to get the hostages home, uh, but to eliminate any threat uh, coming from Gaza. And back out here live, Harris, the White House is backing Israel up today uh, as Hamas and Israel both accused each other of violating the terms of that temporary ceasefire that lasted seven days. And the White House says that Israel is correct, that Hamas uh, violated the terms the IDF said that Hamas refused to release the final 20 female hostages that mm. were being held or are being held in Gaza. And Qatari and American officials are working to negotiate, possibly uh, resuming the pause in fighting that we had seen over the past seven days. But certainly today, uh, it's quite different. I'll All send right. it back to you, Harris. And I know I've been reading on Reuters and Associated Press today that there are uh, that there is some fighting where you are as well at that northern border uh, with Lebanon. And and you and I have been talking daily that 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 had quieted down a little bit. It's ticking <coughs> back up. It's just like there's a war all over. It certainly has, Harris. That <coughs> should be expected. Violated. Congressman Jim Jordan disagrees. He's fired up, and he's here. He's next. Democrats, I can understand why his campaign thought this would be uh, would be smart, but uh, he would have had to have won. On relief, Cosette. Noah Argamani is among those hostages. She's 26 years old, university student who was among those who survived the savage Hamas terror attack on the Supernova Music Festival, where they were parachuting in. She was kidnapped and taken into Gaza. Her mother is battling stage four brain cancer and issued a desperate plea. Ali Diora Argamani God bless her. I don't know how much time I have left. I need a chance to see Noah. Yang or Yelston? is a close friend of Noah. And Jan, uh, you know, the news that we just learned from our reporter, no more hostages coming home at this point. Your reaction? Sad. Sad reaction. He has attacked Donald Trump a lot more than he gets credit for in the mainstream media on a whole bunch of different areas. On policy issues, we just saw that there, but also his campaign has recently really stepped up its efforts to portray 
Donald Trump the way Donald Trump. Choose the plan that's right for you. In which he could have done a lot better. There's also a universe in which Donald Trump does not get indicted and we don't see a rally around the Trump effect that I think hurt the DeSantis campaign quite a bit. You know, I thought it was interesting. One thing. We've always thought that whatever we did here would be an emblem of what small communities can achieve trying to give a better life to people that don't have the means to do it. Si mi papá tuviera vivo, sé que él estuviera orgulloso también de vivir, de estar viviendo una vida como la que estamos viviendo ahora. Esa electricidad que hay aquí, esa luz. to make the campaign about your opponent. You don't want to make it a referendum of what you've been able to do. That's not a reflection on Biden's record. Now at the number. Uh, really loyal to the world, uh, although um, the Hamas side was the ones who fired, but uh, we're not afraid and we're not, uh, so, we're going to stay strong. We still believe, yeah. I, I, I just, I, I want to interject for just a second because I, I want to know, first of all, more about Noah and, and her situation. She was at that music festival. And if you have learned anything more about her condition, you said she was supposed to be next. How do you know that? Was there a list released? Well, no. Uh, this is uh, what we think because uh, mm -hmm. it, they actually said that, first of all, uh, children and mothers and older women. And uh, then uh, People were saying and uh, on the television maybe uh, the, the next one who's going to be released are younger women. Okay. Uh, they'll be next in line. Uh, but we, we, we didn't receive any message officially, and we don't know anything about her condition inside. So uh, officially, the last time that we heard from Noah was uh, on the 7th of October uh, from the videos and from... Uh, Good morning, Stuart. Well, part of what raised this issue of government censorship was the Hunter Biden laptop story that blew the cover on how the government buddied up with social media companies to black out the story. Um, ultimately, the media blackout or the blackout on social media led to many conspiracy theories that it seems some lawmakers still believe about the laptop today. Are you suggesting the New York Post could participate in a conspiracy to construct the contents of the Hunter Biden laptop? No, sir. The problem is that hard drives can be manipulated by Rudy Giuliani. <laughs> What's the evidence that that happened? What's well, the there is actual evidence of it, but the point is it's There's not no the evidence for it. So you're engaged in a conspiracy. I'm glad. For some members of Congress, this issue is personal because they saw their own speech muzzled at the government's request. Congressman Thomas Massey showing how one of his, his tweets was flagged for misinformation for simply tweeting out a scientific study out of Israel on COVID. True information that the government didn't want out there, so they shut it down. But government, but Democrats say that the government working with social media companies to censor Americans is not robbing Americans of the right to free speech. It's enforcing their terms of service. The First Amendment say the government can censor. The time of the gentleman has expired. They're not censoring. They're flagging in the social Chair media companies. So under Chair coercion, coercion, 35 percent of the First Chair, Amendment. Or? Chair it's Reckon. not the First Amendment. It's the terms of service, as you said, and they um, are flagging it for the social media companies to make their own decisions. That is not the First Amendment. That is the terms of service. Yeah. And Stuart, I got a chance to catch up with Congressman Goldman out here as he left after votes, and he clarified that he doesn't believe that the Hunter Biden laptop was a Russian conspiracy theory or conspired by Russia. Instead, he was saying that he thinks that the hard drive that the New York Post obtained was given to them by Rudy Giuliani. It may have changed hands multiple times and been manipulated that way. Stuart? That's a conspiracy theory. Thanks very much, Hillary. House Judiciary Chair Jim Jordan with us now. All right, let's get the <laughs> You're smiling, you know what's coming. Give me the big picture, yeah. please, Jim. What role should the government have in policing free speech online, if any? 
Well, they shouldn't have a role because it's the First Amendment. It's the Constitution of the United States. In fact, Stuart, one of our witnesses yesterday, she was so good, she's from Canada, and she said, if you don't get a handle on this and stop this, you're going to be like we are in Canada and other Western nations. And she, she made this fundamental point. She said the First Amendment, the Fourth Amendment are central. They are foundational to Western civilization. And I don't think that's overstating it. The ability to speak and to speak in a political fashion or to just speak and, and, and project that message is fundamental to America. And the government shouldn't be telling you what you can say, what you can say, what the people can see and what they can't see. But that's exactly what they were trying to do. And Mr. Goldman's point that, oh, there was a 100% of the time when the government's asking social media uh, companies to take something down and social media companies only take down 35% of it. 35% censorship yeah, right. is still censorship. Yeah, right. That's the fundamental point. So that was one, I think, the biggest takeaway from yesterday's hearing. Uh, Congressman, Dr. Anthony Fauci has agreed to testify before the House, uh, House Republicans. This is a first, I believe. I, I presume you're going to press him on the origins of COVID and his connection yeah. to the Wuhan lab. You believe that the origins of COVID are in that lab and that Fauci does have a connection. Is that correct? Well, yeah, because I think anyone with common sense now believes that. I think Fauci knew that right from the get-go. He gets an email at the end of January 2020 which says, virus looks engineered, virus not consistent with evolutionary theory. He gets that email and he instantly goes into <coughs> cover-up mode and the conference call the next day where the story changes, even that person who's sending the email. So I think he knew from the get-go. And never forget, uh, Stuart, Everything the government told us, this is how it ties into the censorship issue. Almost everything the government told us about COVID and Americans were questioning, everything government told us turned out to be wrong. They said it didn't come from a lab. Sure looks like it did. They said it wasn't our tax money. Yes, it was. They said it wasn't gain-of-function research being done at that lab. Yes, it was. They said the vaccinated couldn't get it. They said the vaccinated couldn't transmit it. They told us masks actually worked. So there are six things the government told us that turned out not to be true. And if you question that online, this same administration, the Biden administration said, oh, we're gonna try to censor that speech. True statements, accurate statements, they tried to censor. So that's how bad this whole, this whole thing was. You can get to the truth of what happened in the past, but you can only use that truth to make a change as to what happens in the future. No more yeah. censorship. And that's, that's really where you're going with this, isn't it? Yeah, because, it, again, it's called the First yes. Amendment. And I would argue it's the most important right we have. Five liberties under the First Amendment. Your right to practice your faith, your right to assemble, right to petition your government, free press, free speech. The most important is speech because you can't practice your faith if you can't talk. You can't share your faith if you can't talk. You can't petition your government if you can't talk. That is fundamental, and that's what they went after, and that's what's so scary. Uh how come whenever I was just basically a teenager, I got charged for verbal assault over in O'Brien County because of me having a disagreement with somebody? How can you be charged for verbal assault? I was. But then again, I was charged also for music content being too loud or you having the wrong type of cherry pipes on your automobile towards it being too loud back years ago that now <clears throat> they let all that slide by. It don't matter how loud your vehicle is, your radio and your vehicle, unless you're in a quiet zone, kind of like an RV or, or it's past a certain hour, hour, hour of the day, hour of the night, and also loud pipes and loud vehicles. Those things weren't permitted whenever I was growing up. Now they are. Now they are. So you tell me what's happened to our laws. And as far as me passing out Bible literature to a teller in Martin, Tennessee about one o'clock at night explaining to him that there was a great deal of of uh, problems going on in my life and there was going to be an explosion of controversy pertaining to the material that I was putting out as far as the Martin PD going all the way to Huntington, Tennessee, Carroll County and picking me up, especially after me explaining to them 
that there was no harmful intent in the way that I expressed myself by using it as something dramatic. And I hear it on TV all the time towards using the word explosion. You know, there was explosion of controversy. There was explosion of Bermuda grass in your, in your garden. There was explosion of loudness, uh, rumbling coming from, coming from this or coming from that. I hear the word explosion used routinely all the time. But nobody goes after them. Tommy Moore did. Had to hire an attorney by the name of Benjamin Dempsey because of the charges that Martin P.D. put on me because of me passing out Bible literature to a teller at 1 o'clock at night explaining to him that there was going to be a great deal of, of uh, explosion of controversy going on in my life and I'm liable to wind up on Channel 6 News on account of it. And sure enough, that was in 2005. In 2009, I wound up on the Channel 6 News. Or some news. I don't know. Uh, Oklahoma News, Channel 9 News, Channel 16 News. Wound up on basically national news because of me out there investigating them. Just almost wound up on WPSD News. It just so happens they were smart enough not to identify my name or take a picture of me whenever they shut down the Kentucky Dam, whenever I was telling them that God had showed me that there was going to be massive electrical disturbances, that somebody took out of proportion, blowed it way out of proportion, and the next thing you know, they're questioning me whether or not I had intentions of causing an electrical disturbance by blowing up the Kentucky Dam. I have never seen so many violations nor have I ever seen so much confusion that's going on right now in America pertaining to laws that was put in place for everybody. And I'm one of the first ones that will agree when it comes to freedom of speech. You don't have the right to cry out fire, fire, fire in a theater and create a panic and then suddenly people get hurt. You don't have a right to pull down the fire alarm telling people that there's a fire and there is no fire that creates havoc. There are certain levels of freedom of speech that is prohibited. And there's other levels of freedom of speech that are part of freedom of speech. Just like I'm going to use Donald Trump as a, as a, um, as an example here, just like Donald Trump speaking up against various people that he knows that are trying to ruin him politically, and he speaks up against them, and the next thing you know, they grab up Donald Trump and put a gag order on him. Is that not a violation of freedom of speech? I mean, I realize that you cannot, you cannot go around threatening people. Especially whenever you go around threatening um, various American politicians. I did not, I will repeat, I did not threaten an American president by the name of George Walter Bush in 1991. That was all made up. It was a frame-up job pertaining to what happened in William, West Virginia, that Jolene Nugent, if she's still living, which last time I looked, she was, can help to verify towards her being my public defender at the time that was assigned my case, in basically, word for word, me taking my mini cassette tape player and recording everything that was going on in that hotel room before they nabbed me up, word for word. But yet, no, I spent six months out of my life and to this day still has the frame-up job hanging over my head towards people believing that I actually made such of a threat against an American president. You don't threaten a president. You don't threaten a vice president. You don't threaten a governor. You don't threaten the judges. You don't threaten mayors. You don't threaten nobody associated with the American government. Because if you do, they're going to come down on you. And rightfully so. And rightfully so, just like crying fire, fire, fire in a theater and creating havoc. And the next thing you know, a bunch of people st st stampede 
and a bunch of people get hurt because you was telling them that there was a fire. There are limitations to freedom of speech, but I never violated those limitations. I didn't threaten nobody. I didn't pull down a fire alarm. I wasn't in a theater crying fire, fire, fire that created havoc. All I was doing was passing out some Bible literature, and I told the individual as I was passing it out that there was going to be an explosion of controversy in my life and that I was probably going to wind up on the Channel 6 News. And the Martin PD in Weekly County took that all out of proportion. They went to Huntington, Tennessee. They nabbed me up while I was working for Jimmy Darnell and David Lloyd. First choice body shop in Huntington, Carroll County. Drug me all the way back. And, and, and even after they questioned me about my intent, and I told them that I had absolutely no harmful intent in using using that um, that content of a way of expressing myself and even gave them some examples to go by that just because you use the word explosion or you use the word that you're going to wind up on the news is not a violation of our First Amendment right. So there's no doubt that various people that is trying to get their messages out, such as myself, is and has been violated of our own, own Constitution. Not counting what Homeland Security done to me in 1989 by being a part <coughs> of a shakedown and confiscating a sword from the Windmill Ministries missions that it took the police officers over 30 minutes to get it out of a case and me charged for a deadly weapon pertaining to an aluminum sword that wouldn't even cut hot butter. Now, how much embarrassing on their behalf pertaining to law enforcement can you be whenever we're talking about going after somebody that was basically using, at the time, that particular sword for a teaching aid. It, it's, it's incredible what's happening. It's confusion. Mass confusion that Satan is the author of. So scary. Uh, right now, I believe you're discussing the formal impeachment of President Biden. I take it you are for an impeachment move, correct? We want to formalize with the House vote the impeachment inquiry phase of our oversight duty. This is a sacred duty. This is a constitutional duty. We think we need that because there are key people we want to talk to that we think they're going to, the, the White House and the Biden administration and some of these witnesses are going to challenge us in court. It's not necessary in the con Constitution, but it sure helps when you go into court to say the House of Representatives has had a formal vote and a majority of the House approved an impeachment inquiry. We want you to come sit for this deposition, and we want these particular documents that we've subpoenaed. That's the beauty of why you go, go to this, this step. I hope it happens early, as, hopefully as soon as next week. We'll just have to see. Here's what I'm hearing from some people. The Democrats are not trying to put Trump in court in the middle of an election season. You are trying to impeach Biden in the middle of an election season, like a tit for tat kind of thing. What do you say? That has, that has nothing to do with this is driven by the facts and, and, and the compelling facts we already have. This is one of the most, as the speaker said, this is one of those important powers the House of Representatives have, the, has the, the impeachment power. It should be fact driven. It should be done according to the law and the Constitution. That's how we're operating. But I will tell you this, the facts we've uncovered right now, I think, are pretty darn compelling, particularly how Hunter Biden and Joe Biden interacted with this Ukrainian energy company and what Joe Biden did with our tax dollars when he fired the guy, leveraged our tax money, the people I represent, their tax money, to get the prosecutor fired who was looking into the executive who ran Burisma, the very company Hunter Biden sat on the board. And Joe Biden did that at the request of his son. At least that's what it sure looks like based on the testimony we've already received. Jim, I don't know how you keep it all straight. I, I, I tend to get somewhat confused with names, places, who did what, and who said what, but you got it all down. Jim Jordan, a pleasure. Thanks for being with us. Have a great weekend, sir. Thanks, Stuart. It. Take care. Uh, let's uh, have a look at the markets, please. Yes, there they go. The Dow's up 109. NASDAQ down a fraction. S&P is up 7. Ashley, looking at the movers, what's with Starbucks? Well, the coffee chain is reportedly permanently closing all 18 of its locations in Morocco 
by the end of this year. Apparently they have suffered from low demand thanks to a boycott over claims that they send part of their profits to the Israeli military. That's the rumor. It hurt their bottom line. So, no macchiatos in Marrakesh. Uh, take a look at Alibaba. This stock slipping today thanks to a downgrade to equal weight from Morgan Stanley. But they also cut their price target on this stock from 90 bucks all the way down to $20. The reason for the downgrade? The tech giant is pulling back, apparently, on development of cloud technology. The stock today down almost 2.5%. Stu? All the way down to 20? My, that's a radical cut, is it not? Yeah. Right, Ash, thank you. Yeah. Uh, you remember the Star Trek actor Bill Shatner? Well, he says we're going to die if we don't take action on the climate. Roll tape. Very quickly we're going to die. Much sooner than we expected, we're going to die. Three. And then tell us how to avoid it. Uh, we'll tell you what else he had to say as well. A new report said the CIA conducted secret missions to recover at least nine non-human crafts in the last two decades. Griff Jenkins has the UFO report. Next. <laughs> group of lawmakers is to just back up right there okay a little bit more back up right there and then there's this the office of the inspector general has opened an investigation into the fbi over what ash potential skullduggery Stu. the office of the inspector general investigating why the GSA chose Greenbelt, Maryland to house the FBI headquarters. Now, the selection prompted fierce backlash from Virginia's congressional delegation, which accused the administration of allowing politics to, quote, taint the selection process. Even FBI Director Christopher Wray reportedly had concerns about a potential conflict of interest in the decision. The years-long search came down to three finalists, Greenbelt, along with Landover, Maryland, and Springfield, Virginia. The GSA, by the way, defending its selection of Greenbelt, saying all <coughs> protocols were followed. Well, I guess we'll find out. That's not really what I was wanting, to, uh, or the, what I thought was going to come on right here. You mentioned nine non-human craft vehicles. The government won't come clean on it, so a bipartisan group of lawmakers is demanding transparency to uncover what they say is a cover-up. The CIA now has reports on it, but yet they keep the Pentagon keeps telling us they don't exist. So again, we're spending a heck of a lot of money to tell That's people Matt something Gates to in investigate way. something that doesn't exist. I am hesitant to make that leap. I can tell you it is it is of nothing um, that that I'm aware of having ex existing in our uh, arsenal of assets. Now you heard Stu Matt Gates not going so far as saying he's seen proof of extraterrestrials. But he clearly has seen some of what retired Navy Commander David Fravor saw back in 2004, who testified earlier this summer. A small, saw white tic tac object with a longitudinal axis pointing north south and moving very abruptly over the water like a ping pong ball. There were no rotors, no rotor wash, or any sign of visible control surfaces like wings. So what was it? Gates and Burchett acknowledge what people are seeing could be an identified aerial phenomenon belonging to adversaries like China or Russia. Either way, they're skeptical we'll ever know the whole truth. And Burchett has an amendment to the National Defense Authorization Bill that would force the CIA and Pentagon to declassify documents. We'll see where that goes, if anywhere. Stu? <laughs> thanks, Griff. We'll see you later. <laughs> Can't take the smile off my face. That's just the way it is. All right, thanks, Griff. <laughs> uh, actor Bill Shatner blaming, quote, stupid human beings for climate change. That's pretty strong stuff, Ash. What else had he ha did he have to say? Oh, yeah. He had plenty to say. The man who spent years on television as Captain Kirk exploring new planets 
says we're all going to die on this one if we don't wake up to the consequences of climate change. Shatner appeared on a UK morning show urging King Charles to use his voice to sound the warning at the climate conference in Dubai. Watch this. There's no time to delay. We've delayed all we can. We've got to point everything that is human be humanly possible to cleaning the air and putting nature back to what it was. No, he's got to say, we're all going to die. That's what he should say to open up with. But very quickly, we're going to die. Much sooner than we expected, we're going to die. And then tell us how to avoid it. I think he was trying to put on an, an English uh, king accent there. But anyway, the 92-year-old actor got so a lot of backlash on social media, some criticizing his 2021 space trip aboard uh, uh, Blue Origin, saying it was nothing but a joyride, while others called it hypocrisy at its finest. I wonder what Spock would make of all of this. Probably illogical. Back to you, Stu. You know what I got? I don't think so. I think he would be logical. <clears throat> Because you got to look at the facts of the data of where we are today in comparison to where we was 40 years ago in 1983. is basically whenever they started recognizing that there was something going on. Uh, the Colorado River, Lake Mead, where the Hoover Dam is, has not been at its regular height pertaining to the depth since 1983 and right now it's about 170 foot below where it ought to be or the last I looked it was maybe a little more maybe a little less I don't know but um, you got to look at how many times the Mississippi rivers went dry you got to look or began to go dry not went completely dry but began to go dry you also got to look at um, areas over in Mexico pretending where there's a volcano over there, that their water supply is now down to a tier two. I'm surprised they hadn't done already ro ro risen it to a tier three. They must have got some rains during the winter or something. I don't know. Maybe it was a hurricane. But uh, you got to look at the river Euphrates, pertaining to the river Euphrates, drying about uh, two thirds of the way up. And also you got to look at the facts of what the Bible talks about pertaining to the river Euphrates in response towards if whatever's going to happen on the planet is going to make the river Euphrates, the Mississippi, the Colorado River, and, uh, and the uh, Aquadors, aqueduct system out west dry up, as well as the um, water pool in Mexico dry up or, or be very, very low. You have to put all the dots together in analyzing what is the end game to all this, especially whenever it says in the Bible, not only about the river Euphrates, but it says that as you shall see the days approaching that no flesh shall be saved, but because of the elect's sake whom God has chosen, those days would be shortened. That those days would be shortened. We have brought this upon to ourselves pertaining to the oil mega typhoons that was towed going all the way back into the Carter era that these was going to be the consequences for not only burning fossil fuel but taking the fuel out of the ground that the, ground, the, the fuel was put there in the ground for a heat shield and it was also put there in the ground to reduce friction from all the platelets that's moving back and forth and up and down the high tide, the low tide, the full moon, the half moon, no moon I mean you got to look at the facts and the fact says that we are destined of destroying ourselves. Now, can we stop it? No, I do not believe we have already done went over the Rubicon to the degree that I do not think that we can stop it. But I do believe that we could slow it down. But whenever you have holidays, such as what America just got through going through in Thanksgiving, and it beats all-time records towards people not only flying, but also on their automobiles driving, that tells me that society has not yet been convinced over here in the continental United States that thermal global 
warming is real. They obviously are saying one thing's out of their mouths, but being very, very hypocritical towards still 